Welcome to the High Value Sales Show of Eversprint.com. I'm Malcolm Louie, the managing member of Eversprint, and today we're speaking with John Bly, the CEO of LBA Haynes Strand, a provider of full-service accounting, audit, and advisory services. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks, Malcolm. Looking forward to sharing some ideas today. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think it will be. John, you grew your company's revenue from $4 million in 2014 to $8.9 million in 2017, a 120% increase. And in 2018, you hit around $9.3 million. Before we talk about how you grew your company so fast, can you briefly share what your company does beyond my quick intro and how your company differs from the competition? Sure, absolutely. Happy to. So our, our company's focused on the whole financial picture of our clients. Um, we focus on wealth management, accounting, advisory, tax. We do outsourced accounting, CFO work. And then the other piece that's really unique is that we actually have an M&A division where we do investment banking work, capital raise, debt refinance, buy side, sell side. We're really focused on trying to help the client make sure they get their whole financial picture in one place because our clients are that three to $75 million company. And they just don't want to have a bunch of different vendors. They want to be real targeted and they want to have the best advice and they want to get their picture, you know, all from one place rather than looking around. All right. And I know there are other companies that do some of the work that you're doing. Is it the combination of all the things you, you do that set yourself apart or is there something else as well that makes you a, that gives you a point of differentiation? It's the combination. It's definitely the number one thing that differentiates us is that we do it all and that we have the expertise in all those different areas. But the second thing that actually differs is that we are entrepreneurs. We wouldn't be on this, on this call with you talking about our growth if we were just the typical CPA growing at 3 to 5%. As you said, we've grown well over 100% the last few years. And so the fact that we're entrepreneurs ourselves allows us to put ourselves in the shoes of our clients and walk with them. So as they grow, we're growing as well. And we're also doing things like hiring and acquiring and, you know, letting people, uh, you know, grow in their careers. And all those things are things that our clients are trying to figure out how to do as well. So we can lend that business advisory service, not just from a, we learned it in a book, but that we're actually executing on our own growth strategy. Right. Now, when you talk to a prospective client, a new prospective client, one thought that must run through their heads must be, do I hire these guys who do it? all these things or do I hire two or three or four different companies who are specialists? You know, how do you address that concern when they bring that up with you? Yeah. So we address it as the person you're hiring doesn't do all that. So for instance, I don't necessarily do uh, outsource CFO work, but we have somebody who's specialized in that, that that's all they do. So we have specialization within our company of nearly 85 employees. And so the, the differentiation is the specialization within the firm that, rather than having three different firms. The other thing I'll say is that um, we talk to clients and prospective clients about the fact that we can have many discussions behind the scenes. So, but, you know, if we're helping you with your tax work, your outsourced accounting, CFO type work, and we're helping with, let's say, some of your capital needs, maybe you're uh, going through some debt refinance work with banks, we can piece all those things together behind the scenes and coordinate it without having to get, you know, two hours from the client and get them in all these separate meetings. And so the fact that we can have that synergy really helps save the client time and energy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one thought that's been crossing my mind lately, and I kind of wish I'd asked this question with the, uh, you know, 127 uh, interviews I've already done so far. How did you find an offer that converts, right? I imagine you didn't start offering what you're offering today from day one, right? It, it morphed over the years. How did you find the, the offer that your client said, yeah, I want this. I'm going to hire you guys to do it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We definitely did not start with this offering uh, 15 years ago when I started the firm. We have built it out based on client demand to use your example. We start tracking the things that we refer out the most. So what people were asking us for, and we said, oh, we know Jimmy or Susie or Billy that does that. Here's their name and contact information. And once that got to be a big enough number that we were referring out, we found a way to either hire that expertise internally or to partner internally, like bring on an actual equity partner and, and offer that service. And, and that's really been the way that we've found supply and demand, really. Right. Got it. Yeah, it makes sense too. Right? In a way, you validated the offer, right? By uh, clients asking for it, for it, you fulfilling it. And then when you see that there's traction, you brought it in-house. So that makes That's right. sense. So, all right. Yep. Fantastic. Now, you grew your business quite rapidly. $4 million in 2014. Four years later, you're at 
3 million. What were the drivers of that success? What were the drivers of that growth? Yeah, I think there's a few key areas. One, um, we continued to execute across the merger strategy. Um, so we constantly look for growth in our markets and in to expand into other markets. Um, and and when, especially when we're expanding into other markets, we look at you know, trying to acquire or merge in a firm that's a little bit smaller than us. So that's one. Second is to use your question a second ago is new service offerings. Um, we have launched a few different service offerings since 2014, really trying to focus on helping our clients get a more uh, holistic view. And then the third, the third driver has been we do a lot of public speaking. Um, but we do that both within our markets and outside of our markets. And they could be either on a specific topic or service offering or it could be given to a specific niche. Uh, so for instance, we have a large dental practice and uh, we do some national speaking on the de at dental conferences as an example. Right, talking about accounting for dentists or legal or M&A, what type of topics do they like talking about? Yeah, so we can be agnostic almost. We try not to talk in the legal sense, but we definitely talk in the M&A. We talk in the outsourced accounting and we talk about profitability. So one of our drivers of our consulting practice around the dental niche is uh, we do a lot on the profitability consulting and how to analyze those numbers and provide benchmarks and KPIs. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit deeper about the three drivers you shared with me. Uh, the first one you said was M&A. Second one was new service offering. The third one was public speaking. Uh, sure. For the first one, uh, M and A, how do you go about deciding what to acquire, uh, where to acquire, and when to acquire? Yeah, we spend a lot of time on that, actually. And we start with culture. For us, if, if the cultures don't fit, we don't bother with how the numbers look. Um, and, and it's got to be something that fits who we are. It's got to be some a, a team that's client service focused, interested in growth, interested in providing a holistic view of the client rather than just doing one thing. And so uh, from a starting point, when we look at mergers and we have opportunities, that's what we do. How we go about finding those opportunities, we do that a number of ways. We directly market to our competitors. So we, we direct mail um, about 50 to 75 competitors every six months. We also let bankers, attorneys, uh, financial advisors, anybody we can that's in the professional services field that might be working with accounting firms, let them know that, hey, look, we're looking to grow and this is one of the ways we're looking to do it. If you know somebody in the field who's looking to, for a transition or a growth strategy, you know, would love an introduction. Okay. So, uh, so when do you do it? Do you, do you say, oh, you know, I need to grow our geographic presence in this area. We need to add this capability. You know, how do you decide the timing of the acquisition or do you acquire when something comes along that's at a good price and a good fit and you just do it? Both, both. Um, we, we get both strategic about a location. So for instance, we've expanded recently into Winston-Salem uh, earlier this year, and we are very targeted in that market right now trying to do an acquisition. So we've, we've been very focused on the firms that are there that we think need a transition plan, and we've been heavily marketing, calling, meeting with firms in that market. That, so that's one. The second is there are opportunities. For instance, one came across our desk. They reached out to us last September, October um, to try and get us to help them with their growth strategy. So they're, they're sort of at a point where they're capped out from a human capital perspective and from a knowledge base and, and they want to add services, but they really can't afford to do it. And so they'd love to plug into our uh, growth strategy and, and use the services that we provide. Okay, and when you fund these acquisitions, how does it work? You talk to your friendly banker and you say, I'm gonna do this acquisition. They have this sort of cash flow, it's gonna add to our our bottom line, you know, and we're going to borrow this much from you to fund it. Is that how you do your acquisitions or is it other ways? Yep. That's one way. We do it a couple different ways. That's one way. The other is if they're a, a I'll say what a, a non-retiring CPA, meaning they're, you know, in their thirties or forties or fifties and looking to plug in their engine into ours and grow their income and long-term equity. Then in that case, it's more of an equity swap, which happens sometimes. And then the third way is depending on the practice it may be an earn out over a period of time based on uh, their book of business, their clients, their employee retention, those sorts of things. And so definitely all three of those ways are used and sometimes they're all used in, in one deal. Right. So when you started the company 15 years ago, um, and if you just looked at that core company, the one that started it all, how much did that company grow, say, in terms of employees and then how many other employees came via acquisition? Yeah, so I would say, um, organically so we've grown from zero to 
85 employees, let's say, and of that, about 50 are acquisition and 35 are uh, organic growth. Okay, so 50 are acquisition. And, and how many different markets are you in now? How many different cities are your people spread across? Yep, we're in four cities uh, in North Carolina currently, uh, four different cities. We haven't expanded into other states yet, but um, hopefully doing that in the next 12 to 18 months. All right. Now, how far apart are they in North Carolina? So they're all about one and a half to two hours apart. We do have two offices that are, that are within an hour of each other, but everything else is an hour and a half to two hours. Okay. And I mean, there is some distance separating each of your offices. How do you guys uh, stick together and maintain the culture and connectivity and have people know each other? Yeah, that's huge. We do a handful of things. One is we're on regular video calls between the offices. So different teams have video calls on a weekly or monthly basis. So for instance, our administrative team meets by video from all the offices at 8.15 to 8.45 every Monday morning. Um, the other things that we do, we do firm-wide uh, video calls on a, a trimester basis where we give financial update of the firm, performance, growth strategy, all those sorts of things from a high level. Um, we also do you know, a, a once a year holiday party. We do uh, two times a year, we do a charity event with a team building activity tied to it that's firm wide. So we go to one location and uh, all of us will get together and do that. So we try to do as much as possible from a big picture. And then on a real small scale, um, our, our management team rotates between the office. So we try to have people between the offices at a minimum one to two times per week, people going between offices so that they're, uh, they're sharing their managing other people that it's not just uh, office by office silos. Right. And the nature of the work you do for clients, is it done in person at the client's site or is it oftentimes done remotely and the people in your four offices help out each other? Yeah, it's, it's all, I would say 95% of our work is done remotely. Uh, the clients come to us certainly for meetings, et cetera, or we go to them for meetings, but the vast majority of the work is done remotely. And there are certainly times when a Charlotte based client may be getting work done out of Greensboro, uh, just based on staff requirements, based on uh, who's got availability and time and, and can fit that need and the expertise. Right. Got it. Um, for, Number two, you were adding new service offerings that, and you're focused on helping the clients. Uh, where do you draw the line as to you know, when a client wants a service and you say, yeah, that, that's just too far out, out of our wheelhouse and you know, that's something that we're just gonna refer you to someone else to do? Yeah, it goes back to supply and demand. If, we, if a client asks, if enough clients ask for something, eventually we're gonna offer it in-house. We, we tend to refer things out that you know, we get, five or six clients a year who ask for something, we're going to refer that out all day long. But when we get 30, 40 clients asking for it every year, then that means we could probably keep somebody busy full time. And, uh, and so that's the sort of stuff we bring in house. Okay. How many clients are you working with right now? We have a total of 800 corporate clients and then the shareholders that relate to those companies. Well, that's a lot. Yep. Seems like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I take it you don't know all 800 of them. I definitely do not. I know the names of probably 700 or 600, but I have a, I've certainly not met them all. Um, and, but I know the names just because our partner group talks about our clients on a regular basis. Yeah. And the third one, lots of public speaking. Uh, you mentioned as the as third driver. Now tell me about how that drives the growth of your business. Sure. So a handful of years ago, I wrote a book on mergers and acquisitions. And that got us started in the speaking world. Uh, I started to speak not just within the area, but also both nationally and internationally. And then as we thought about the expertise areas that we have, we started to direct market to associations within our three markets uh, for, for instance, trucking or technology or dental so that we could get in front of large amounts of potential prospects all at once. And so at the end of those, many times we'll get anywhere from five to 15 potential leads, prospects, follow-up calls that come from that, which turns into a handful of clients uh, after almost every single speaking engagement. Right. Okay, good. And now the limiting factor of this, although it's great that you're marketing to a group and you're getting you know, five to 15 people interested in learning more, it's still a function of your time, right? For sure. For sure. Absolutely. So um, do you still feel it's the best use of your time to do this or does it make sense and maybe scale it up even more and start doing online public speaking, start holding webinars. Yeah, we do hold, we hold um, probably five webinars a year. What I find though is 
because of the nature of what we do, we don't get nearly the inbound lead generation out of that. It's interesting when you're, when somebody's paying for a conference, let's say they're paying a hundred dollars or $500 and we're one of the speakers at the front of the conference and there's 400 people in the room. We're looked at totally differently than when we, you know, offer up our own webinar and it's on our site and we're the ones marketing it. Then it's looked at very differently. We don't get the same response rate. We might get 10 to 30 people on those, but many of them already know who we are to begin with. Right. Well, for sure, the ones who are going to the conference and forked out some money and there's and they carved out a day or two of their time, right? There's hand over fist. Those are better prospects, right? Than someone who just sits behind their computer and who knows what else they're doing, watching. What you're doing. <laughs> yes. But still, though, I mean, if you uh, if you did an automated webinar uh, that's running all the time and your marginal cost of doing it is almost zero, then you know maybe it still makes sense to run those things. Get yeah, that's absolutely that good. Are interested? So, yep. Are you doing that now? Like automated We're, webinars? We are not doing any automated webinars. They're all live. Right. Yeah, there's some benefits of doing live stuff, right? People want to get questions right away. Yep. Or rather, get questions answered right away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Looking a little bit forward, 2019. What's the plan for 2019? What are your revenue targets, and what are the challenges, and how are you going to get there? Yep. So our revenue target for 2019 is 11 million. I'd say um, some of the challenges is to continue to eliminate. We talked about how we're trying to constantly be in other offices to help eliminate some of those silos by office. The other things we have to continuously work on being an accounting firm is, you know, if you're serving XYZ client, you need to be thinking about all the other ways that other experts within the firm can help that client. And so helping to continue to break down the barriers from the silos of a client service perspective, I'd say that's one of our biggest challenges for 2019. Cross-selling essentially. Yes. Okay, great. Now, how about from a lead generation side of, of getting new clients? What's the, what's the plan there? So we're currently undergoing a brand new uh, website overhaul. So we have a 2013 website that we put on HubSpot and SEO'd and, and built a good platform. And we get a lot of inbound leads through that website. Our largest client currently came through the website, which people always laugh because they think, oh, it's an accounting firm. It's very personal, et cetera. Um, and nobody looks at websites, but that's a joke. Um, you know, our largest client came through the website. And so we're, we're currently undergoing uh, hopefully launch by May 15th or May 31st of this year. Uh, we've been spending the last couple months on it. That's the number one objective this year. The number two objective is we built out uh, a model at what we call a client centric model around building client value with our services and, and making sure that we keep that in front of uh, our partners, our managers, our teams, and also make sure that we're letting clients know we even offer these things. We've grown so much over the last four or five years and we have so much expertise in human capital in house that sometimes clients that have been with us a long time don't even know all the things we can do for them. Right. What's the plan on letting them know or helping them learn what you can do for them? A few things. One, we built out a physical model that now sits in our conference rooms so that every meeting partners are discussing it with clients as they're having the meetings. Uh, another one is that we're having, it's going to be the core focus of our new website. The third is we are going to do presentations between May and August. Uh, with current clients to discuss all of the different service offerings we have. Okay, good. So what does a physical model look like of all the services that you do? So it's got, you know, sort of our firm in the center, if you will, and it talks through uh, growth advisory, risk management and consulting, tax solutions and planning, accounting solutions, hiring solutions, business valuation, financial planning, outsource CFO. But it's a it's a Prezi, so it's, you can click on each one of the bubbles and it goes down into the 10 or 15 services that are in, say, growth advisory or in risk management and consulting or in the tax solutions so that it's very interactive for the client, but it's also something that we can talk about at a high level um, so that they can understand the different offerings we have. Right. So it's a two-dimensional interactive sort of thing. Yes. Okay. So it's not like a physical three-dimensional model with spheres <laughs> floating <laughs> around. No. Okay. No. All right, got it. So, um, in regards to uh, online marketing, I took a look at your pay-per-click presence and your SEO presence, and my assessment is um, uh, I didn't see any pay-per-click, and the SEO that you currently have, the, the value of the traffic that's being generated, um, isn't huge. Uh, so, what's your take on that, pay-per-click versus 
uh, I agree. SEO. I agree. We don't do anything on the pay per click at all. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying we haven't considered it, but at this point, based on what we've seen from an industry data in the accounting profession, um, we haven't seen a lot of people going that route. And the ones that we have don't seem to have as much success unless it's very targeted. So for instance, we've considered doing it very specific to the dental niche uh, because our niche there is so strong and, uh, and it is national. Um, for SEO, I would say uh, we, we benchmark ourselves on a monthly basis against other accounting firms within North Carolina. And we actually rank uh, surprisingly very high. Um, and so we use HubSpot to help us figure that out behind the scenes. And um, for a firm our size, we rank uh, about 10th or 15th in the state. And there's probably 100 firms that are larger than us. And we still rank inside the top 10 or 15. Right, right. Yeah, the tool I was looking at, um, it, it didn't rank for specific keywords that might be relevant for people who are searching for accounting firms in, in uh, North Carolina. It was just looking at the traffic you're getting and what keywords are coming to. And, and those keywords might not be the most relevant ones. So my, in my tool, it's just a tool. It may not be the most relevant and accurate tool in terms of the results it gave me. So uh, don't feel bad when I say that my tool <laughs> didn't show uh, uh, good numbers for you because it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a broad tool. Nope, that's uh, that's understandable, and uh, I would say that accounting firms in general would probably score very low, I guess, uh, on any of the tools that are out there. So, what where I'm where what I'm saying is, if you compared me to, uh, you know, an IT company or a you know digital marketing company or anything like that, I'm sure we'd score really, really awful. Uh, when you compare us within the industry, I think we score pretty well. Yeah. So, what what sort of outbound marketing are you doing? So we do a few things. One is we do some uh, direct mail. Um, not as much of that as you would have five or six years ago, but we do some of that. We also have an outbound uh, newsletter that goes out on a monthly basis. We have a, about 3,500 people who receive that newsletter. We, the other thing that we do is we have an outsourced sales and business development arm to the team. And so they're you know, lead gen calling, cold calling, uh, very specific targets. So for instance, we'll go through campaigns where we'll call construction companies for 30 days and then we'll call uh, not for profits for 30 days, et cetera. And you said it's outsourced, so it's not part of your company. Correct. We outsource it to a firm that's accounting specific. So that's all they do is lead gen for accounting firms. Okay. And when they, how do they do that? When they call a company, are they representing you? Yeah. You know, how does, how does that work? Yes, they're calling on our behalf. They're representing us. They're talking as if they're the sales team of our organization. And then they're, they're really trying to get their door openers, if that makes sense. They're not closers. They're trying to get us appointments, meetings, you know, phone calls, follow-ups, anything they can to, to, to drive interest, not to you know, actually, quote-unquote, finish the sale. Right, exactly. All right. And have your clients ever asked for the person they spoke to after they talked to you and then find out that they really were just outsourced partners as opposed to being full-time employees? Nope. We've never had that. We've never had that uh, follow up mostly because in our business, the person who does the sales and business development type stuff typically is not the expert in the field. And so they're not going to be the one who's the delivery partner, if that makes right. sense. Right. Right. So they talk to them, see if they're a good fit, hand it off. And then they probably will never talk to that person again. Correct. Right. Okay. Me at the company party, they might bump into them at most. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what do you see as the trends unfolding in your, in your industry? Yeah, there's a couple of big ones coming. One is things like blockchain and uh, the automated recognition software and tools are huge. Those things are driving a lot of efficiency within technology for accounting, audit, tax. So that means we need to be more advisory focused and less compliance focused. So that is something we've been actively working on the last two years, but it is a key focus over the next couple of years. The second thing, second big trend is the retirement of baby boomers. And so the average age of a CPA in the United States right now, I believe is 59 years old and that's average. So that tells you there's a lot of individuals that are significantly above that number. And those folks are retiring out at very large numbers. And so that leaves a succession void, which provides opportunities to both pick up clients in the markets and it allows us to pick up potential merger or acquisition targets because uh, there's going to be a, a, a huge succession problem. Yeah. Another uh, company that I just interviewed, they see, they foresee the same sort of thing. 
um, their average age is it's for a company that does uh, investment management. And he mentioned how the average age of the financial advisors is like 69 or something like that, right? <laughs> so they're even yeah. further down the path and he, he foresees the same sort of thing. Uh, and many of these are small shops and they have succession issues. And he saw that as an opportunity, right? His firm can now uh, provide that succession option for these other companies. Yep. Right? Uh, when they're ready to sell, they're there and they can already begin the transition and start working with their existing book of clients so that when they do hand it off, it'll be a seamless transition. That's so, right. Pretty interesting. Pretty, and I can see uh, something that, that could be exactly something that you could do as well, right? Yeah, it's been, our county it, firms. That's right. Yeah, it's something we're acu acutely focused of and really fit, uh, making sure that we get the right culture and the right targets for opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Very cool. Now, you mentioned uh, blockchain. How does blockchain fit into the picture here? Yeah, as it relates to blockchain, to the extent it becomes widely adapted, especially for us, the privately held companies, to the extent it just affects the public companies, you know, it's never going to have a huge impact on us. But as it relates to privately held companies, in theory, long term, it could really reduce the amount of pure accounting day to day that has to be done. So, like our outsourced accounting group where we you know, provide outsource uh, a bookkeeper level accounting that could, that could become a, a thing of the past. The other thing that could be uh, potentially transitioning is the need for audited financial statements for small uh, and mid-sized privately held companies, including nonprofits, because the blockchain will provide assurance of transactions. And so a lot of times that's what we're providing. And so it'll change potentially some of the service offerings and provide it and we'll have to adapt and be responsive to those needs that clients have. What's the timing as to when blockchain would be accepted as a uh, assurance of a transaction? Yeah. You know, for companies that we deal with and the size we deal with, I think we're at least three years away. I, I think if you're talking bigger public companies, you might be talking a shorter period of time. Uh, but I think it's probably at least three years away, 2022, probably at the earliest. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm not totally up on my blockchain and not totally up on how it, it will pertain to companies, but as a consumer, how would I see this? How would it impact me? You know, it, it probably, as a pure consumer, it probably wouldn't affect you that much, honestly. Not, not in a way that I've seen that would be material at all today. Okay. And how about as a business owner? How would this help my business? Yeah, as a business owner, it would help eliminate a lot of fraud. A okay. lot of finance fraud, both from your internal staff and from uh, vendors. So vendors who overbill you, double bill you, things like that. And then from your bookkeeper who's doing your books, paying bills, accidentally makes mistakes or intentionally makes mistakes. Um, either of those would, would in theory, the, the likelihood of that would decrease significantly with blockchain. Right. Got it. Uh, any other trends that you see happening in your industry? Uh, the only other one is just ever increasing uh, regulation and demand. So for instance, the Trump tax laws that were put into place at the end of 2017 provided a tax overhaul that hadn't been seen since 1986. So um, huge amounts of, of changes in the system provide opportunity, but they also provide challenges, uh, both from a workforce standpoint and human capital. Um, and, and that's just one area of regulation. We continue to get regulated in all areas of our business. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, so if, if you had the magic wand and you could wave it and, you know, have whatever you wish for come true uh, business wise, what would that be? Whew, that's a tough one. There's so many good things to wish for with a magic wand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would say that I would wish for um, a little bit of deregulation because I think it would help uh, some of our clients. Um, and then I think it would be to, continue to find opportunities to expand into other markets. We'd love to expand down to Atlanta and up to Richmond, Virginia and up to DC. So finding the right targets in those markets is critical for us over the next two to four years. Right. You said you, were, you, you talked before about uh, doing outreach to accounting firms, right? To see if they might be interested in a merger or an acquisition. How does that process typically work? You know, what is the initial message you, you send to them and to, to get them to say, yeah, let's talk. So accounting firms, we start with, I mean, something pretty basic like a letter and, and we send those every six months. And what it says is something pretty simplistic, which says, hey, look, here's where, here's where we're at. We've got, you know, gone from 4 million to 
11 million over the last few years. We're looking to continue to grow. These are the types of services we offer. To the extent this has any interest to you and you're looking for either a growth plan and you want to potentially talk about joining us, or if you're looking for a succession plan because you don't have one internally, we'd love to hear from you. And it's pretty much that basic because you've got to keep it short. And so that's yeah. you know about three paragraphs and, and keeps it pretty, pretty short and simple. Okay. And what's, you, know, you, you sent out a hundred of these letters at one go. Now, how many people will respond to learn more? We typically get every single time between five and 10 responses. And some of them are, hey, thanks. I'm not ready now, but I, I, I'm going to keep it. And I'll, I might be interested in a year or two. Some of them turn into immediate phone calls and, you know, some discussions at a high level. And then if it goes farther, we turn them into, you know, potential due diligence and letters of intent and all that. Um, but five to seven, maybe 10 on a high end, every, uh, every 100. And typically we'll get at least two to three very serious that we go far down the pipeline on a deal with. Ah, very cool. And uh, how long does it take for you to do a deal? Usually about six months from the time we first, you know, I'll say meet someone. Um, if we know somebody's business already and we've already been, you know, sharing clients or something like that, it can take less. But typically from start to finish, from the first time we have a discussion till the time we close, it's six months. And, and how many acquisition targets are you planning to do in general? Yeah, so in, in 2019, we're hoping to do at least one, possibly two. Um, we currently have, you know, upwards of 10 legitimate targets that would, that would do something over the next one to three years. Not all these people have uh, very specific timelines. So, you know, they take lead nurturing and time to, to have good discussions with. Uh, but I would, I would say we'll do at least one this year, if not two. Right. Okay. And that's generally the plan going forward for now? Yes. One or two a year. Okay. Is it pretty easy to find the targets? It is because public accounting firms are pretty easy to search for. Um, things like the local business journals always provide a top 25 list in any given market. Uh, and then the third thing is our North, you know, in any state, there's a state board, state society that regulates a profession and the CPAs are all have to be listed. And, and you can generally get the size of a CPA firm straight from the state board. Yeah. Now, do you do uh, any sort of digital marketing to these companies? Or potential acquisition? We do. We have built some SEO stuff into the back of our website, which will, which puts some keywords around accounting firm for sale, accounting firm acquisition, talks about our own mergers and acquisitions. So we get two to three inbound leads through the website for mergers a year. Ah, nice. Always nice to get the leads from SEO. Yes. That, you know, once you build it, they can still come. So that's pretty good. Absolutely. Three last questions for you, John. What message would you show on a billboard along the freeway that's typically going to be seen for six seconds or less before people drive by it? Whew, six seconds or less. That's a tough one. Um, I'd go with something around becoming the tax accounting and advisory arm of your privately held company. Something like that maybe that, that captures the essence of the fact that we're, we're almost like a board of directors. We have so much expertise in human capital. Uh, in-house. Right. Got it. Tax advisory arm of your company. I almost yeah. wanted to say you're a, you know, almost sound like you were a, what did you say that in uh, Sopranos, the consigli, <laughs> like that? Yeah. That phrase. So. And the two last questions. Who are your ideal clients and what's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah. So our ideal clients are three to $75 million revenue companies, first generation, uh, because typically the first generations doesn't hasn't built out a management structure. It hasn't built out all the leadership capabilities. They're looking to grow. They're looking to maximize their learning and 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 get it from one source rather than go into five or six different vendors. So that's our ideal client. Um, best way to contact us. Uh, our website's www.lbahs.com, and also my email is john j o h n bly b l y at lbahs.com. All right, fantastic. John, it's been awesome having you on my show today. I really enjoyed hearing how you grew your company so fast. Thanks, Malcolm. Appreciate you having me and uh, look forward to the next time we catch up. Yeah, definitely. We've been speaking with John Bly, the CEO of LBA Haynes Strand, about his company's rapid growth. 
for interviews with other fast-growing, high-value sales companies, or to learn how we can accelerate your firm's high-value sales for automation, visit Eversprint.com.